Um, and so I should just note that this is really an opportunity to talk about these ideas. Uh, you don't have to be an expert in these ideas. Uh, you don't have to um, you know, have any particular background in the practice of yoga or in the theory of yoga. Um, really, we just want to talk about it and see what comes up in terms of what strikes us during the reading. So feel free to discuss and um, ask questions and make comments as, as you see fit. So um, before we begin, maybe we should just go around and introduce ourselves quickly. Uh, my name is Neil. I am the treasurer of Blazing Star Oasis. You are here. <laughs> you are here. Still. Yeah. I'm Val. I'm also here. What's up? I'm Audra. Here. <laughs> I'm Ben. I'm there. <laughs> Good. Um, all right. So uh, let's dig into the lecture then. Introduction. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to start with some history and background. Um, so Aleister Crowley was actually one of the first Europeans to study, practice, and teach yoga as a, sort of a serious means of spiritual attainment, a way of actually getting results with the practice of yoga. Um, so Eastern ideas had begun to make their way into the West. Um, in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. So you see people like Schopenhauer starting to pick up um, ideas from Buddhism and Hinduism in his work. Um, but it's really in the um, early 20th century, uh, late, uh, excuse me, late 19th century, early 20th century that uh, the ideas, Eastern ideas, begin to emerge as a uh, as, as ways for actually attaining spiritual results in terms of a practice. So with uh, people like the Golden Dawn, the Theosophists, uh, we actually see an influx of Eastern ideas into a framework of Western occultism um, and an appropriation of these ideas as a way of making um, the ideas of Western esotericism expand to include uh, Eastern spiritual uh, ideas. So along with the founders of uh, Theosophical Society, for example, um, Crowley was one of the first people to introduce yoga to the West as a means of spiritual attainment. And yoga became a central aspect of Crowley's own system of attainment resulting in an, an infusion of Eastern spiritual ideas into Western esotericism or Hermeticism. So an understanding of how Crowley employed not only the practices, but I think also the philosophical uh, ideas of yoga in his own system of attainment can teach us a lot not only about yoga itself, but about the Lama in general. All right, so Crowley's earliest training in yoga begins in Mexico in 1900 as he is climbing mountains with his friend and uh, mountaineering partner, Oscar Eckenstein. Um, Eckenstein teaches Crowley how to basically focus his will and imagination in concentrated thought. So Eckenstein, as uh, Crowley and Eckenstein are climbing mountains, Eckenstein is basically teaching Crowley these methods of meditation, which are in, in sort of their bare bones, incredibly simple, but just very simple techniques and methods for concentrating the mind according to particular methods, types of practices that we find um, in Crowley's uh, description of the yogic practices themselves. So interestingly, Eckenstein was a railway engineer and an analytic chemist by profession, uh, and he had no interest in the occult. And I think it's very much reflective of the type of practices that Crowley is doing at the time. They're very bare bones, they're just very simple techniques for um, 
meditation for concentrating the mind. So Crowley actually confides in Eckenstein during one of their expeditions that he was troubled to find dramatic ritual dissatisfying. And Eckenstein's reply to him was, do you know what your problem is? You're unable to control your thoughts. You're scattered and you waste energy. You have to learn how to concentrate. So Crowley, um, in his confessions, uh, recounts Eckenstein saying to him, give up your magic with all its romantic fascinations and deceitful delights. Promise to do this for a time, and I will teach you how to master your mind. So again, I think what we're seeing is um, Crowley very early on is learning these practices for concentrating the mind, which are incredibly practical and sort of down to earth, just effective means for focusing the mind uh, in, in concentrated thought. So Crowley further in the Confessions writes, under his careful tuition, uh, under Eckenstein's tuition, I obtained great success. There is no doubt that these months of steady scientific work, unspoiled by my romantic fancies, laid the basis of a sound, magical, and mystical technique, right? And so this is totally the case because the, the practices that Crowley begins to learn here as he's climbing mountains with Eckenstein, um, and these practices are further developed with his study under Alan Bennett later on, become central to his own system of attainment in um, orders like the AA or Astrum Argentum and the OTO. And so I think this, uh, Quote from Hymenius Beta from the Forward to the Second Edition of Eight Lectures on Yoga is also very um, um, interesting in this regard. So he writes, Crowley also took to, took to heart an implicit lesson that the efficacy of yoga does not depend on the externals of the cultural matrix in which it evolved. Right. So in other words, that um, Crowley is basically learning yoga in a setting which is completely divorced from any traditional practice of yoga, right? So he's not studying uh, in an ashram or under a guru. I mean, Eckenstein is basically his guru, but basically just a teacher. And so this is in a context where there is no um, sort of uh, traditional cultural or religious or dogmatic context in which yoga is being learned. And Crowley takes that to heart and the practices that he develops are capable of being undertaken by anyone, irregardless of where they are situated in terms of their particular cultural, cultural milieu. Right? So anyone can pick up book four and start to do the exercises which are um, outlined there. Okay, so that's a little bit about the history and background. Um, and there's a ton more to say about this, but we simply don't have time. Um, so I want to get into uh, a couple other things. All right, so Crowley classifies the practice of yoga under the heading of mysticism. So we have mysticism over there on the left. Um, in part one of Lieber ABA, also known as uh, book four. And the yogic practices that he outlines there constitute one of two central pillars in uh, his own system of attainment, the other pillar being, of course, ceremonial magic. And the two of these taken together are intended to culminate in an experience, uh, a type of spiritual experience, uh, an awakening of one's own inner genius, or creative potential, or what is sometimes also called uh, knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel. Okay. So this is a direct experiential apprehension of truth. Um, and, and another way of saying this would be union with the divine or union with God. Okay. 
way. And so what I'm suggesting here is that mysticism and magic are two pillars which have the same goal in mind. The same goal is being aimed at in both. Um, so if we take a look at the subtitles to these parts of book four, um, part one, mysticism. Sorry, this is sort of cut off here. I don't know why it keeps doing this. Um, the subtitle of part one is Meditation, the way to attainment of genius or Godhead considered as a development of the human brain. So, meditation, the way to attainment of genius or Godhead considered as a development of the human brain. And the subtitle of part two, magic, is ceremonial magic, the training for meditation. All right, so you can't see that here, but the subtitle for part one is meditation. What's the red circle? The red circle is <laughs> the red circle is simply um, it's a it's a feature of the PowerPoint presentation that I'm using. Oh, it's, you didn't put that there. Nope. Oh, graphic okay. I thought it was like okay. a, a sun disk or something. Nope. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, so subtitle ceremonial magic the training for meditation. Um, which seems to suggest that magic is actually being employed, ceremony or ritual is being employed as a kind of a way of obtaining results in yoga or in meditation. Right? And so I think this is something that not a lot of people um, think about very much, is that ceremonial magic can actually be a way of training, a type of training for achieving results in meditation. Now it might seem like uh, ceremonial magic is being relegated to the position of the handmaiden of yoga, um, and I don't think that's quite the case. So, um, here's a couple of quotes from Crowley talking about this. There is no limit to what theologians call wickedness. Only by experience can the student discover the ingenuity of the mind in trying to escape from control. He is perfectly safe so long as he sticks to meditation, doing no more and no less than that which we have prescribed. But the mind will probably not let him remain in that simplicity. It would almost seem as if one could not successfully practice meditation until the will had become so strong that no force in the universe could either bend or break it before concentrating the lower principle, the mind, in meditation or yoga, one must concentrate the higher principle, the will, in ceremonial magic, the training for meditation. Okay. Crowley goes on to say, it will now be apparent that there is no distinction between magic and meditation, except of the most arbitrary, arbitrary and accidental kind. Right, so again, he's saying that Mysticism and magic are ultimately serving the same purposes. They're just training different types of uh, modalities in terms of the construction of the human organism in order to reach that mystical goal, right? To reach that magical mystical goal. Uh, so actually in eight, le eight lectures on yoga, if it's not already clear that this is the case, it probably makes it very clear uh, in terms of mysticism and magic, or yoga and magic, he writes, it is the cooperation of lovers, which is here a symbol of the fact. The practices of yoga are almost essential to, are most, almost essential to success in magic. At least I may say from my own experience that it made all the difference in the world to my magical success when I had been thoroughly grounded in the hard drill of yoga. But I feel absolutely certain that I should never have obtained success in yoga in so short a time as I did had I not spent the previous three years in the daily practice of magical methods. Right. So uh, what we see is that there's an essential interrelation between the uh, type of meditation and concentration which is developed 
in yoga and the training uh, of the will, basically, and of the imagination, which occurs in ceremonial magic. And the two of these taken together represents sort of a synthetic system for obtaining uh, what people often refer to as gnosis or a direct <coughs> spiritual uh, experiential apprehension of, of truth, right? Or of God or of divinity, whatever. Okay. So any questions so far or keep moving through this? Or comments? Where did Eggenstein learn Yoda? Did he have did he study in India? That's a good question. Um, I don't think Eckenstein was familiar, familiar with yoga um, as a, sort of a distinct cultural practice. Um, I'm not sure where Eckenstein actually learned the techniques which he taught Crowley, um, but they weren't taught to Crowley as yogic techniques per se. They were techniques that Eckenstein had developed in order to concentrate his own mind and I think obtain success in um, endeavors like climbing mountains. And such. So Eckenstein doesn't have a particular lineage which he's uh, drawing from in terms of um, yogic practices. Right? He just has these techniques that Crowley finds are very useful for concentrating the mind. So Crowley will later go on to study with Alan Bennett, Bennett in Sri Lanka, um, and there he actually starts to learn um, yogic uh, practices proper, right? Um, and sort of um, develops more thoroughly what he has begun to learn under Eckenstein. Yeah? My sense is that there's that quote you had from Eckenstein where he's like, you know what your problem is? Uh, I think you meant like your problem with life, not like your problem with yoga. Like in general, like your right. problem with mountain climbing, with whatever is, you can't concentrate. It's not like a specific yogic practice. Uh, and it was very specifically in the context of like trying to climb mountains, which takes a lot of concentration right. and that kind of thing. Uh, and I think part of the point of, of uh, Hymenaeus Beta's quote is that he was teaching these practices not even for spiritual attainment. It was right. just like for life efficiency, basically. And that's the implicit lesson. It's like it doesn't have to be in this cultural matrix. It doesn't even have to be for the same purpose that culture points to, which in like the Hindu yoga is liberation. But you know, I can say I was more interested in getting to the top of the mountain, literally. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. This, this is book. Total. <coughs> this is before he received the book. Oh, well. Uh, so, 1900, yeah. It's like the before. same time he supposedly went through masonry when he was in Mexico? Yes, actually. Okay. This kind of led up to a lot of this stuff. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He did seem to be all over the place at that time. That's the beginning of Equinox of the Gods, right? When he, just, he was doing so much magical stuff. He was kind of like 10 different things at the time. Yeah, I mean, he like went through the whole golden dawn and he like attempted the and first major attempt at K2 and, and all that. Like, like, was, like was three busy. months of just praying in his house and stuff? Yeah, for Melon. Or maybe he was going to do that. I don't know. He wasn't going to do that. Right, so um, let's, let's dive in a little bit more into uh, what... Um, the, the idea of yoga, which comes out of the reading of eight lectures. Um, so we get this refrain throughout the first lecture of the series, yoga means union. And we hear this over and over again, yoga means union. So I want to look briefly at the etymology of the word, which Crowley recounts, but we'll go over it again. So yoga means union. Um, yug is a proto indo uh, Indo-European root, which means to join. Uh, zoigma, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, is the Greek, from the Greek, meaning a yoking together. And yugum comes from the Latin, meaning yoke. 
So we get this idea of a joining together or a yoking together out of the, the root of yoga. And we get the refrain, yoga means union. It's a joining together or a yoking together. And also, interestingly, Crowley notes that the word religion is really identifiable with yoga. It means a binding together. Right, so that's some food for thought. Um, religio, meaning an obligation, bond, or reverence, or religare, meaning to bind. So we have something like a binding together, a yoking together, or a joining together. Also where the word ligament comes from. Ligament. Nice. Right. So um, the question then is what is bound together or joined together? Are yoked together in the practices of yoga and the results of yoga. Uh, and Crowley is um, rather explicit about this. Um, he says yoga means union. Yoga is first of all the union of the subject and the object of consciousness, of the seer with the thing seen. Right. So yoga is first of all the union of the subject and the object of consciousness, of the seer with the thing seen. He goes on to say, in analyzing the nature of this work of controlling the mind, the student will appreciate without trouble the fact that two things are involved, the person seeing and the thing seen, the person knowing and the thing known. And he will come to regard this as the necessary condition of all consciousness. So, I mean, if you think about this in terms of the way in which we walk around the world, we are sort of perceive ourselves as a distinct self, um, interacting with objects in the world which appear to be separate from ourselves. Um, so, in perception, in consciousness, for the most part, what we have is this distinction between the subject and the object of consciousness, between the seer and and the thing seen, or the knower and the thing known. Finally, something happens. This consciousness of the ego and the non-ego, the seer and the thing seen, the knower and the thing known is blotted out. That's a union of the subject and the object of consciousness. The knower and the thing known is blotted out, this distinction. It is an absolute knockout blow to the mind. By its light, all other events of life are as darkness. And this experience of the um, blotting out or the uh, falling away of the distinction between the subject and the object of consciousness has commonly been referred to as um, union with God, or at least this is one way of talking about it, is being union with God. Um, union with the absolute, uh, the one, or all, or dissolution back into the not, or nothing, void. Um, vision of God, the vision of God. Uh, and in terms of yoga, the terminology of yoga, samadhi. Okay. So another way in which people often talk about this is as gnosis. Um, a kind of a direct experiential apprehension of the truth which transcends our no normal dualistic presentations that the, that the mind is usually engaged in. Right. Okay, so yoga is first of all the union of the subject and the object of consciousness of the seer with the thing seen. Um, just to make this uh, relationship between yoga and ceremonial magic, um, uh, just to sort of hit that one more time, that thesis, uh, there's this quote from Magic and Theory and Practice, 
in which Crowley writes, there is a single main definition of the object of all magical ritual. It is the uniting of the microcosm with the macrocosm, the individual with the universe or God. The supreme and complete ritual is therefore the invocation of the holy guardian angel, or in the language of mysticism, union with God. So again, uh, we see the essential interrelationship between ceremonial magic and yoga or meditation. Right, right here in sort of fundamental text on ceremonial magic. Okay, so uh, there's this relationship between the subject and the object of consciousness, and um, uh, practices which are intended to result in the union of the subject and the object of consciousness. But Crowley seems to find this process of union occurring in all of nature as such. And he gives a number of examples to illustrate this. So one of the examples he gives is in biology, or uh, in particular in terms of sexual reproduction. We see this process of union or yoga and the results of it occurring. So in sexual reproduction, um, you have an ovum, an egg. Right? When that is combined with the male sperm in fertilization, when they fuse, it results in a new thing, namely a single-celled zygote which includes genetic material from both of the original gametes. So genetic material from um, the female egg and from the male sperm. So you have two things which are completely distinct, right, and separate, and they fuse together in a very organic and natural process. And in that fusion, they create a third thing, which is distinct from the original two things, but which has its own unique nature or characteristic or properties. All right, so it partakes of both, but it's this new thing which arises out of union. So this is one way um, to begin to think about the type of union we're talking about in terms of our conscious consciousness. Um, when, we're, when we're practicing yoga, this is sort of an analogy to help us get into that state where we can figure out what it is we're aiming for. Um, here is another example from chemistry. These are all examples that Crowley gives. Uh, so, for example, chemical reactions. Uh, this, a chemical reaction is a process that leads to the transformation of one set of chemical substances to another. Right? Um, so, if you take hydrogen gas <coughs> and you combine it with oxygen gas, in the right way, you get H2O, right? You get water. You get a new substance out of the combination of the previously two separate elements. Right? So you can continue this process indefinitely until you get some more rarefied and unique compounds. So for example, if you add potassium to H2O, you get a really fucking awesome explosion, and you also get a solution of potassium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. Right. So new elements arise out of the combination of uh, baser elements which are distinct and separate. Right. So we see the same process of union occurring at the cellular level um, and occurring at the level of chemical interaction or chemical reactions. I think um, that we also see this process occurring in terms of our cognition, right? So if I make a statement like Mahatma Guru Sri Parnahansa Shivaji oh. is Aleister Crowley, right? I've taken two concepts which are distinct in themselves, combined them together in a linguistic formation, and produced a sort of a package, a little package of knowledge for you. Right? I've given you a piece of information through the union of two separate and distinct concepts. Or that tree over there is a uniper. Right? Very simple, mundane statement, but I think this reflects the process of yoga that Crowley is talking about. 
So two different things, words or concepts, join together in thought to produce knowledge. Or falsity. <laughs> huh? Or falsity, like if you pretend two things uh, that are totally irrelevant. Yeah, I should say, I should say information, <laughs> maybe yeah. not knowledge. It could be bad information. Yeah. <laughs> It could be bad information. This is very true. That's a question. Okay, so um, more fundamentally, I think so. Crowley sees this process of union occurring in all of our experience as such, and I think this is actually one of the most important things about what Crowley has to say about yoga. Um, is that it's something which is occurring all the time, right? Union is a process which he sees occurring in all of nature, but in particular, in terms of every, every kind of experience that we have, some kind of union is taking place. And one way of thinking about this is as the union of the perceiver with the thing perceived. So whenever we walk into a new situation, whenever we decide to go out, to a club at night, or go to school in the morning, or go to our job, we're encountering a new situation, we're achieving union with a new subset of the possibilities which are available to us to experience. And it's that union of the perceiver, of the subject, and the perceived, the object, which creates our own subjective phenomenal experience, what we're experiencing all the time as these um, bundles of consciousness and emotions and thoughts and drives and such. Right? So experience as such is something which results from the um, processes of yoga. And so if you, if you take that premise and run with it, then all experience can be seen as the ecstatic result of this yogic joining or yogi process. Right? And this is a very interesting notion. Um, if we also take this um, idea, which we hear often, uh, love is the law, love under will. Love is the law, love under will. Crowley writes that love is the instinct to unite, yoga, right? Love is, love is yoga. Love is the instinct to unite and the act of uniting. So it's both, the, it's, the, it's the drive to unite, like the movement towards the union, and also the union itself. So love is the law, love under will, love under will being emphasized, but this cannot be done indiscriminately. Right? It must be done under will, that is, in accordance with the nature of the particular units concerned. So if yoga is something that we're doing all the time, we might want to think about how to actually do that in accordance with our true will, in accordance with our fundamental nature, so that the union which we achieve in our experience is something which is actually in line with our deepest sense of, of self and ide our identity. All right, what else is here? And ultimately, um, this is to be directed, this, this instinct for union in terms of the, the yogic goal so the end game of yoga is uh, union with the absolute, or un union with God. So much. It's interesting that, insofar as, insofar as he, all of our experience is the ecstatic result of a, a perceiver uniting with the perceived thing, yeah. that Philema has a uh, a metaphysical system where. You know, that's true on the microcosm with, like, each one of us as an organism. And then, like, in the macrocosm on the level of the universe, that's also true on the po in the polemic metaphysic that the entire universe, not just your subjective personal experience, but the entire universe is the result of the yogic process. Yeah. Except between Hadith and New. And right. And so it's basically a uh, yogic metaphysic. I can't think of a different word, but like a, yeah. it's basically saying, yeah, that, but also like on the universe level. Right, and I think that's one of the things he's pointing to with the examples in biology and chemistry as well, is that this is uh, sort of a, a metaphysical process 
um, that can be seen going on in all of nature, or such, or all the universe as as it is, as it occurs. Um, but but more particularly, I think also what's interesting about that is that it provides a kind of analogy for what's going on in our own conscious experience in terms of the process and the activity of union, right? So. Uh, the way I read it is as a kind of a metaphor or uh, uh, a, a way of thinking about this to get us attuned to the type of processes of union, right? And again, we're probably just speaking in metaphors here, right? in union, which is occurring in our experience all the time, and how to direct those processes under will, uh, and eventually towards union with the absolute. But yeah, it's like it's definitely an all-encompassing type of metaphysical system. Um, it seems that yoga teaches you how to do things under will most efficiently. You know, to will things willfully. Uh, <laughs> uh, but do you think it also reveals the nature of the particular units concerned, or do you think it reveals the nature? to direct the will in the first place. Is it, so does, does yoga reveal the nature of the particular units concerned? Right, so, so all things are love. It can't be done indiscriminately. It should be done under will, yeah. which is in accordance with the nature of the things involved. Like you shouldn't unite things that like will be bad for right. you, at least. Uh, and it seems like it's teaching you to unite as efficiently as possible yeah, like your faculties are trained to the utmost, but it, does it also help you distinguish what that underwill is? Does it help you distinguish what the nature is of these things so as to unite or not unite? Does that make any sense at all? No, it does. I, I, so um, <laughs> so does, does, does yoga actually give you any knowledge in, uh, of your true will? Basically. Right, so, and, and I think um, that's probably one of the things which yoga is intended to do. Is the steady practice of yoga is in, uh, intended over time to reveal to oneself what their true nature is, what their true will actually is. Through engaging in these processes of union, I think it becomes clearer over a period of time um, who one actually is, where, where their sort of place is in terms of their general um, position in life and in the universe. And it makes it clear wh what one is actually doing, what one is actually about by engaging in these yogic, uh, yogic practices. I think it does yeah, actually reveal that. Does that somewhat address it? I believe it does address it. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so, so ultimately union with the absolute is the goal, union with God, right, or apotheosis. Um, the recognition of the divinity and sovereignty of the individual self. And so Crowley writes, every thought in our being, every cell in our bodies, every electron and proton of our atoms is nothing but yoga. So again, the cosmic metaphysic here, and the result of yoga. All we have to do to obtain emancipation is to perform this universal and inevitable operation upon the absolute itself. All right, so why don't we just do it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what's what's next? Uh, let's let's go unify with God. Um, Crowley does bring up some obstacles which might arise um, in this path towards union with the absolute. So he writes. In highly civilized countries like our own, loud laughter, the individual is constantly being attacked by conflicting interests and necessities. His individuality is constantly being assailed by the impact of other people. And in a very large number of cases, he is unable to stand up to the strain. Schizophrenia, which is a lovely word, is an extremely common complaint. It is rare and rare to find a man or a woman with a mind of his or her own, and a will of his or her own, even in this modified sense. Um, so I think, actually, 
uh, I, I introduce a quote from uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, um, who addresses this very issue in, uh, in a number of writings, but he's got this nice quote in Beyond Good and Evil, where he writes, human beings have in their bodies the heritage of multiple origins, that is, opposite, and often not merely opposite drives and value standards that fight each other and rarely permit each other any rest. Our drives now run back everywhere. We ourselves are a kind of chaos. Uh, so I think this is a very illuminating um, notion, um, and it, in fact, it gives rise to things like spiritual disciplines and self-help, even uh, the modern um, disciplines of psychology and psychiatry, is the fact that as human beings in the modern civilization, we are somewhat fragmented. Uh, we have our, our uh, personal lives and relationships, our professional lives, maybe our religious lives in one quarter and our family lives in another corner. Um, we have all sorts of personal wishes, wants, and desires, which are not necessarily unified in any particular to, towards any particular one goal or direction. Um, and so, the condition which is being pointed out is one in which the human being, the human organism, doesn't have a kind of overarching structural goal to help it integrate all of its particular parts. Um, and so one of the practices of yoga then is to try and unify ourselves to achieve, to achieve a goal, right? To, to sort of address this concern that both Nietzsche and Crowley are bringing up that in ourselves we are somewhat disunified, right? We, we, we go, we try and unite and achieve yoga in a number of different directions, and it often keeps us from actually achieving um, significant results in our life. So here's another quote from Crowley. Um, the majority of people in the world are ataxic, uh, which means sort of like uh, they can't exercise their will. Uh, they cannot coordinate their mental muscles to make a purposed movement. They have no real will, only a set of wishes, many of which contradict others. The victim wobbles from one to the other. And at the end of life, the movements cancel each other out. Nothing has been achieved, except the one thing of which the victim is not conscious, the destruction of his own character, the confirming of indecision. All right, so it's a very bleak prognosis, which Crowley points out there. I mean, but it's somewhat true. I mean. Um, and, and I think it's nothing to be necessarily uh, scared of. It's, it's, it's a fact of the construction of the human being that we are sort of drawn in a number of different directions. And in order to achieve results in, in our individual lives, we have to learn how to focus our energies towards particular goals. And so hence yoga, and hence the practices of yoga in particular. It is therefore incumbent upon us, if we wish to make the universal and final yoga with the absolute, to master every element of our being, to protect it against all civil and external war, to intensify every faculty to the utmost, to train ourselves in knowledge and power to the utmost, so that at the proper moment, we may be in perfect condition to fling ourselves up into the furnace of ecstasy, which flames from the abyss of annihilation. Okay. Not so, the product that most people are going to buy. <laughs> it sounds like a metal album to me, I'd buy it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> flight from the abyss of annihilation. Uh, yeah, I mean, but, you know, if you sort of <clears throat> break that down um, in terms of uh, just sort of common experience, basically what it's saying is, you know, train, train your faculties, train your emotions, train your mind, um, train your, um, your will in order to be able to achieve the, the type 
of union, which is naturally being sought as a, an, an organism, you know, which is going after things in life. Um, and ultimately, you know, this can be directed, these, these things that we learn in yoga and in magic, can be directed towards uh, things like spiritual attainment. And, and knowledge or gnosis.